that invitation to, to speak this morning. It's uh, about half past five uh, in the morning on a freezing cold uh, Tuesday. I'm joining you from a hospital stock room in a uh, regional hospital in Queensland. So there are a couple of issues that might come up during the talk, which I'll talk about. Uh, first and foremost is the very low quality internet that we have in Australia. So if we hit into a, run into any hurdles, I hope that uh, with a little bit of uh, engineering, we might be able to sidestep some of them. But if you, if you miss something that I'm saying or you don't understand, please feel free to just pop something into the chat um, and uh, I'll try to address it as, as soon as possible. All right, I'll just pull up my slides here. Um, and so I'm aiming to speak for around 30, 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes um, <clears throat> on an introduction to programming for doctors and medical students. I'm aiming to spend around half of that time on um, you know, why you might want to learn to code, um, what you can achieve with it as a doctor or a medical student or anyone interested in healthcare technology. Um, and then we're actually going to talk a little bit about how to get started and maybe even write a very simple computer program at the end just to sort of whet the appetite, so to speak, for, for interest in this kind of thing. Um, I've got my email on the front slide here and, and my Twitter. So if you have questions, um, you know, after the show or you want to talk to me about your specific situation, I'd be very happy to connect with you um, and talk about what your options are in terms of going forward. Um, so this is just a quick bit of geography. I'm in uh, Brisbane is the nearest major capital city to where I am on the, on the east of, of Australia. Um, and I'm in Gundawindi, which is a tiny little town about four hours southwest of Brisbane at the moment, right on the New South Wales border, which has recently closed. So it's been quite a while uh, due to the COVID pandemic. It's been a fairly wild time to be practicing medicine right on a border that's closed and people trying to sneak across, etc. Um, I've already touched on that we might have some internet issues. I'm actually also sitting about 25 metres away from the hospital helipad. So there's actually a, a non-zero chance that someone might get airlifted out during the presentation, in which case I'll probably have to pause my microphone for a little bit just for uh, kind of medical privacy reasons. Um, but I, I think that's fairly unlikely. Um, a little bit about Gundawindi. There's about 6,000 people here. And um, this is a statue of... of um, a horse, a racing horse from the 1970s that is kind of like the town, town mascot or the town hero. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a, it's a farming town. It's a little bit of a cowboy town. It's, it's quite um, a little bit old school in some respects, but there's still some really exciting innovation happening out here, like health innovation. Um, for one, that the hospital, the local family medicine practice and the nursing home have an integrated IT system. So when you're working in the ED, for example, you can see a patient's blood pressure and medication history for the last 15 years, which is fairly innovative. I don't know, what, I can't speak for what it's like in the UK and for where you're joining. Um, but that's a highly innovative thing in Australia where most of our hospitals are still on paper charts. <clears throat> um, you know, we've got continuous glucose monitors being deployed around town that automatically upload your, your blood glucose and send it to your endocrinologist and they can micromanage your insulin. One of the, the, the GPs, one of the family doctors out here is launching an app called Family HQ um, to act as a shared medication record for, for parents of chronically ill children, which is pretty cool. And I guess just by, I just wanted to mention that, you know, innovation can happen anywhere at any level. And so I'm in this, you know, outback town of 6,000 people and there's all this cool stuff happening. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a, a PhD in a major tertiary center to get involved in health innovation. Um, <clears throat> a quick bit about me, I don't want to waste too much time, but I'm, I'm a doctor from Australia doing my first year out of med school. I'm, I'm very interested in health technology, innovation, entre entrepreneurship, global health. Um, I've, I've worked on a lot of different projects as a software developer. I've made lots of iOS and Android apps, that some that are garbage, some that are reasonable. Um, <clears throat> that's actually I think one of the main ways to learn is actually by trying to build things. And that's very much how I did it. I, I incrementally made um, improvements with every project that I built over, over a couple of years. I made a thing called daily medical trivia, which is kind of like a medical education um, uh, suite of games. Like there's a web, a web game and a mobile game, etc. I also made a blood transfusion app that's live at the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital and the Sunshine Coast Hospital. Uh, I'm about, about to release that programming book. Um, and I've also done an internship at an Israeli Mentech startup called Healthy IO, um, which has raised more than um, 90 million US dollars. So they're very much the real deal. And that was an awesome experience. And if you get an opportunity to do something like that and you're really interested in technology, I, I strongly encourage you to pursue it. Um, and the other thing I should just disclose, I'm, I'm not an expert data scientist and I, I don't 
present myself as one. Um, I'm very interested in AI and I do follow the AI scene and I do tinker with AI um, <clears throat> programming and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm, I haven't studied data science and I, I'm, I'm looking, it's an area I'm looking to grow in, but I don't present myself as an expert. So if you've joined the call as an expert data science, data scientist, I'd like to um, connect with you, but um, go easy on me. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk a little bit about why you might learn to code as a doctor or a medical student. Or, or anyone who's interested in health innovation, not just clinicians. Um, and there's a couple of reasons, and I, I, I divide it into kind of personal and, and societal factors. So factors that you will benefit you individually, and then factors that will benefit society. So on a you know on a personal level, you know it's an excellent excellent creative outlet. So I was I was very math science oriented in high school, um, and it wasn't really artsy and I guess being able to program allows you to create things that are visual that can solve problems that can um, you know change the world and so that it's a great creative outlet it's a great hobby in, um, <clears throat> uh, the next reason is it'll help you identify innovation opportunities so I think once you know um, how easy it can be to set up software systems to do to solve certain types of problems not all software systems are easy to set up but once you see how easy it is to set up certain types of software systems you'll, it'll help you actually see opportunities in your day-to-day -day life for for innovation um, there are broad career progression opportunities so you know med tech startups are really hungry for techie doctors there's this concept of problem owners which i've got there in, in bold which basically refers to people who um, experience problems on a day-to-day -day basis and, and companies that are developing solutions to these problems actually really value insight from people who have experienced problems that they're trying to solve so um, lots of med tech startups want insight from doctors and so by being techie and a, a clinician you, you get you're highly sought after <clears throat> um, it can open up new avenues of research you know not just you know machine learning all that fancy kind of stuff but you can actually use programming as a research tool so um, you can automate um, you know collection of data you can automate organizing your data you can um, really turbocharge research in a sense and I, I um, have further examples that I won't go into now but it is a great research tool there's potential for additional income you can automate the boring stuff I have a couple of examples coming up one relating to my roster like my hospital roster um, it'll help you stand out you know I don't know what it's like in the UK and the countries that you're joining from but um, you know in terms of um, medical career progression is a real bottleneck at kind of the mid-career level where um, consultancy jobs or jobs at the highest level of medical training are getting harder and harder to get um, and so I think looking for different ways to stand out is um, uh, a, a good thing to do if, if, if that's what you're after a, a hospital career path and I think um, programming projects can um, really uh, potentially make you look like a far more competitive candidate um, and you know you can scale your impact so rather than you know um, changing the life of one patient at a time or one department over a career you could potentially you know change medicine um, or the way the world practices medicine um, and you can you know build medical education materials there's lots more reasons but I'll, I'll move on for now um, and this is just to this is a slide from the healthy IO website uh, where this is the, the Israeli medtech startup where I interned um, and this is just to remind me to talk about uh, at this time the company was growing really quickly I think in the year before I joined, they'd grown, grown from 20 people to about 80 people. Um, and while I was there, they actually grew from 80 people to 100 people. Um, and even, so providing education to their company about even the basics like, you know, um, first we take a history from a patient, then we examine him, and then we order investigations. Like just basic paradigms, like that kind of knowledge that I had was very, very valuable to the company. Some other reasons, societal factors. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I might try and power on a little bit. You know, we can create innovations that are affordable and accessible. We can change culture. So we can, um, techie clinicians are generally more open to change and open to innovation, implementation of innovations. Um, and health is a sector that's um, notoriously slow to pick up um, innovations. And so by um, uh, getting doctors involved in technology, I think they'll be more open to, to implementing these things. We're going to need a whole new class of clinicians to oversee machine learning models and, and critically analyze them. Um, you know, our health expenditure, as a, at least in Australia, as a percentage of GDP is growing. So we need efficient and affordable healthcare systems. Um, and we need clinicians to, who are able to 
safeguard patient health and privacy while we're sort of digitizing our health sectors. And just a quick news article here about a, um, a project to introduce the electronic medical record into Queensland hospitals. Queensland is the sort of the province or the state that I live in. Um, and basically it was a complete disaster because there wasn't enough consultation of clinicians and not enough clinicians who were um, uh, techno technologically minded to help oversee the project. Um, a quick bit about what you can do with programming skills. So a good like kind of beginner level project is to create a mobile app with some hospital guideline information. So this is a, a blood transfusion app that I made that has um, <clears throat> basically all it is is a repurposing of a hospital guideline that was previously on an A3 sheet of paper on the wall. Um, and it, it is a, a app that helps you interpret, interpret a Rotem. I don't know if you have Rotem in where you guys are practicing. Um, uh, TEG is an alternative. Basically, it's a test where you spin blood around and you look at the kind of clot that it forms. And based on the shape of the clot, you can decide what blood products to give. And this app helps you basically translate the shape of the clot into a certain amount of which blood product you want to give. So that's the long and the short of it. Um, you can create innovative medical education resources. So this is a thing that I made. It's a kind of a, it's a iOS app that's kind of a combination between Candy Crush and medical school. So you see that path there. Each of those is a, um, a level that's got some questions about uh, a certain topic within medicine. This is another guy I found on Twitter. His name's Tom Fabial. I actually didn't put his <laughs> name on the slide annoyingly. Um, kind of like uh, radial, but with an F, Tom Fadial. Um, he's made a thing called ECG Stampede, which is a really, really fun game where you kind of go through and rapidly triage ECGs and it gives you a score at the end and all that sort of stuff. Um, another reason to code is you can make research accessible. So this is MD Calc. Uh, if any of you guys are practicing in hospital, um, I suspect you will have used this at some point, you know, to calculate a, a, ch um, a CHADS2 VASC score or a Wells score or any of the scores that have been validated. This kind of gives you access to them in your pocket, which is pretty cool. Um, you can, you know, simplify patient care and communication. These are three Sydney doctors who are residents in Oncomp. With some automation, you can actually set up a, a project that um, will grab that roster, look for the shifts that I've got and put it straight into um, my Google Calendar. Pretty cool. You can also do silly things like make Twitter bots that read tea leaves. So this is a Twitter post that I made that, you know, when you retweet it, it'll guess your medical specialty by looking at your profile. You know, it's no more accurate than, uh, you know, um, a fortune cookie, but that was a good bit of fun. You can get involved in machine learning research. Um, so if you're, for anyone who has absolutely no idea how to get started on machine learning or AI, I think the very first thing you should do is go to Teachable Machine. I think it's teachablemachine.io, I'm, I'm not sure, but if you Google Teachable Machine, it'll pull up a very simple um, uh, web app that was written by Google. Um, and basically it lets you create your own fairly, <laughs> fairly powerful machine learning models. Um, and as you can, I don't know if you can see that picture there of the, um, the lady who, with the, um, the box underneath and what it does is it basically turns your webcam into a, a, an image classifier. So you, you upload a lot of images that um, you want to train it on. So in this one, she's using images of herself and, um, her, and another one, uh, uh, another set of images that are her and her dog. And on the website, she actually drags her dog in and out of the um, image. Um, you can see uh, that the classifier can identify her or the dog. Well worth it checking out. Um, just to learn the absolute basics of labeling data, et cetera. And there's lots more you can do. All right, that's about halfway through the talk. Um, what I wanna do is now talk about like making a very, very simple computer program and how you might get started. Um, and this is a question I get asked a lot, you know, how do I, what's the very first thing I should do to get started if I wanna achieve X or Y or Z or how do I <laughs> do Hello World? Yeah, I guess I will be doing Hello World. Um, uh, just going to quickly talk about what different programming language, programming languages can do for you. Um, so a, a really common starting point is HTML and CSS, which is some people won't even like me referring to this as a programming language because it's, you know, it's not as such, it's a markup language. And what that means is um, it helps you decorate and arrange things on a web page. Um, and there's not really much logic. So that's why people don't like calling it a, programming language but having said that it's a really good starting point because it helps you create visual things and I think when you create things that you can see it's a lot easier to maintain your motivation to continue. Um, next one to talk about is Python which is a great all-round programming language great for web development, data science, automation 
um, and there's lots of open source machine learning libraries. So if this is something you want to get involved in, um, uh, it's a, if you, if you want to get involved in data science, Python would be the absolute best language to start with, I think. Um, and then there's PHP, which is a very versatile web programming language and is a very vibrant community. Lots and lots of, um, uh, different tools that people have made that you can repurpose for your own projects. Um, it's primarily for web development, but we're actually going to do our examples today in PHP because I think it's, um, uh, again, very versatile and can run very well with HTML and CSS. And to be honest, so does Python, but, um, Anyway, that's the language I've chosen for today. You can use Flutter, which is actually not a, a language in its own right, but it's a, a framework, um, which basically means it's a, a project that someone else has built in another language called Dart. Um, but the reason I really like Flutter is that it helps you create iOS and Android apps from one code base. So if you're working on a project, you know, perhaps yourself or with yourself and one other friend in your garage, um, uh, using iOS and uh, making essentially apps on two platforms, what's called a cross-platform app um, from one code base is, is very uh, um, effective rather than having to build the app twice. And then there's JavaScript, which is inc um, incredibly versatile. Um, some developers love it, others can't stand it. I'm probably more in the latter boat, um, mostly because most of the projects that I've done are in other languages. I, I acknowledge that JavaScript is an incredibly powerful language. Um, I have never really gotten too deep into the community um, and yes, you can also not code. Yes, that's a, a very great option. And I have a long blog post of talking about, um, uh, you know, if your objective is to get a software project off the ground right now, then coding is actually not the fastest way to do it. Um, but if you um, do see yourself getting involved in technology kind of for a career, then I think it's still worth investing in. And then there's other languages like R, which is kind of a bit um, more out there a little bit. Um, it was originally for statistics and you might have done some through your statistics course at uni if that's something you've studied um, but it's fairly versatile nowadays but having said that I, I wouldn't really recommend this if you're unless you really want to get very deep into kind of a statistics game um, there are other languages that are more versatile in my personal opinion um, all right so what we're going to do is we're actually going to write a short computer program now um, and uh, I'll note that um, to do this the way this I'm doing, to do this the way that I'm going to do it on my computer, there is a little bit of self involved, but I don't really want to go into that in the 30 to 40 minutes that I've got with you. I think it would just be a very boring way to spend our first talk. Um, so what your options are is to look, you, if you wanted to do this kind of stuff at home, you could look into setting up a development environment on your own computer, um, which you could Google and follow some guides. Um, alternatively, you could use a tool like Khan Academy which actually has an in-browser editor. In fact, most of the free learn to code websites actually do have a, um, an editor that you can just sort of use out of the box on their site. Um, Khan Academy is a fairly good one. Um, Treehouse is another one. Um, free Code Camp is another one. Um, I have a whole list of free coding resources that I can um, send to you if you're interested. Um, all right, so let's get into our, our demo here. So, um, let me just arrange my screen sharing so that I can share my whole desktop. All right, so, oops. So what I've got here is, um, what I've got is called a, a tool called Sublime Text, which is a, a free coding editor, ma editor made by um, an Australian company. It's actually not free, it's got a indefinite evaluation period. So if you're, um, it's worth getting a, uh, um, considering getting a pro license if you like it. I've got a pro license on my desktop, not my laptop. Um, and so you can get this for free and this uh, helps you program in a whole range of languages. There's lots of other options too. You might have one that you like more than this one, but that's okay. And over here, I've got a, um, what's called a terminal window on, on um, a Windows machine. It would be a, a command prompt window and to open terminal, the easiest way to do it, I find, is to hit um, uh, command and space on a Mac, which opens um, Spotlight. Just type the word terminal and hit enter. And that will, I'm not going to do it now because I've already got a window open. But I've got um, a terminal window. And what this does is it lets us um, basically run computer programs um, rapidly. So what we're going to do is in this folder, I'm just going to create a new file. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through basically the absolute basics of programming. And if we get time, we're going to turn it into a, um, a little 
body mass index calculator, which is a good little project to start with. Um, and so we're going to do this demonstration in PHP. Um, and any, any PHP file should um, end in .php. And it needs these funny little tags at the start and the end, um, which I won't go into more now. There's, a, there's more to learn there. But um, the first thing to learn is, so I've got, I've got a blank file at the moment. Let's, let's run this file and see what happens. As you might imagine, we get no output. There's nothing in the, um, the program hasn't yielded anything. It hasn't outputted anything. So the way you output something into this um, program is using the word echo. So I'm going to go echo. And in this case, I'm just going to echo a random number. And I'm going to put a semicolon at the end. Now when I run the script, you get 26. You can see that there, 26 has been outputted, which is good. We'll just clear the screen. Now I'm going to add something at the end. I don't want you to worry too much about this for now. But basically what that is going to do is it's just going to add a, a blank um, a blank line. So now that our output is on a new line. So that's basically like a new line character. All right. So we know how to put some, um, output something as a program. Let's do something else now. Let's echo um, some words. Um, and when we echo words, we use double quotation marks normally um, to, to kind of encapsulate the word. And this is called a, a string. So a collection of words or numbers is known as a string. And so if I run the script now, it, because we're echoing, we're echoing hello world, we get a hello world as the output. So this is, this is stereotypically the first thing you do when you're learning a program language is learn how to print echo world. Uh, hello world, excuse me. Um, so we've done that. All right, next thing we're gonna learn about is um, uh, variables. Um, and what variables are is they are a, um, kind of like a vessel that we can store information in. Um, so in this, in this example that I've prepared here, we're gonna store a string and the string is Socrates inside the variable name. So anytime you see a single equal sign, what that means is that you are storing the value on the right inside the value on, on the inside the variable on the left. So in this case, we're storing Socrates inside the variable called name. The one of the reasons I like PHP for beginners is that every variable is introduced by a dollar sign. And so anytime you see a dollar sign, it's very easy for you to identify what is a variable. So in this um, instance, we've stored Socrates inside the variable name. Now, so what can we do with it once it's inside a variable? Well, we can echo variables like this. And you can see that because I'm echoing name and Socrates is stored inside name, we get Socrates as an output when we, when we echo it. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about um, combining our variables. So if we have a second variable, so I looked, I furiously Googled this last night and Socrates, if he were alive today, would be 2,490 years old. Um, and we can combine variables in, in a certain way. So we can um, do something like this, where we go, his name is, okay, name. <clears throat> so his name is name, and his age is, or oh, and he is, Echo age, echo years old. So we run this now. His name is Socrates and he's 2,490 years old. So in this way, we've kind of created a sentence by using a combination of strings and variables. But using this many echo statements is a bit of a pain in the backside. So if I was going to do this in a real, he is really old, yeah. So if I was going to do this in a, a real application, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. The simplest way is to actually, rather than using a statement for every expression, is to use a dot in between the two things that we're trying to combine. So if we run this now, you can see that we get the same thing because a dot kind of like, it's called concatenation. What that means is it merges, two things, it merges two expressions together into one kind of string. So I can concatenate all of these. Um, by putting a dot in between. And I like to put a space either side, which is not necessary, but I, I like that it makes it very obvious that you've got a, um, a dot in there. So his name is name and he is, oops, I didn't concatenate the age there. 
and he's 2490 years old. And if we run it, you can see that that as, um, I'll just clear it so that it's a bit more obvious. His name is Socrates and he's 2490 years old. Um, very good. So we can concatenate things. We can combine different expressions and, and send them out as an echo statement. Very good. All right, the next thing we'll learn is some very simple arithmetic. So in this case, um, here we've got, we're gonna use our age variable again, and then we're gonna set a new variable. So new age equals age plus 10. So in this case, we're, set, oh, we're setting the variable age to 2490, and then we're gonna create a new variable and we're gonna remember anytime you see an equal sign, you're setting the value of new age to the value of age plus 10. So anytime you, <laughs> yes, I got an email um, during the talk. Um, and so if I run the program now, um, I, got a, I, I get no outputs. And actually, if you're listening closely at the start, you would work out why we have no output. I'll give you a second to think about it. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't call it. Yeah, so I didn't call echo. So all I did in that, in the when I when I run it like this, there's no um, uh, there's no expression to actually send new age as an output to the to the script. So to actually get some output, I have to call echo new age, and because we've set new age to the value of age plus ten, we'll get. Um, I'm going to save the file if I run it now. Two thousand five hundred. So we've added ten to the age, so we can add. We can also subtract, <clears throat> we get 2,480. We can multiply using an asterisk character. We get 24,900. And we can also divide using a forward slash. We get 249. So that's um, uh, a basic, um, uh, some basic arithmetic. So you can add, subtract and multiply and divide. Um, and so what I thought we'd do now is actually create a bit of a, a BMI calculator. So those on a body mass index, it's basically a, um, uh, a score of how heavy you are compared to your weight. And it is useful in medical context to determine, um, I guess, where you sit on the spectrum of, of, of body weights. Um, and um, so what we're going to do here is um, use some basic arithmetic to calculate someone's BMI. So um, to start with, we're going to start with a, we're going to use, um, uh, what were the values I prepared? So 94 kilograms. So the weight is in kilograms and the weight of uh, the height should be in, in meters. So I've just got two random um, values here. And then we can use the arithmetic tools that we just practiced to actually calculate someone's BMI. So um, the way we're going to do that is by creating a new variable called BMI. And then we're going to set the value of BMI to um, the formula that um, we use to calculate BMI, which is weight divided by height times height. And so <clears throat> um, uh, we've now calculated the BMI and set the value, the, the variable BMI to this value. And so now if I go echo, BMI, remembering that we need any time we want to create output in our terminal, we need to use an echo statement. And so if I run the script now, we get a BMI of 27. So um, this BMI is slightly overweight um, with the normal range being 18 to 25. And we've written a small little computer program that can calculate someone's BMI. Um, I'm coming up right on 30 minutes. What I might do is, is just one little quick more demonstration. I had a little bit more that I prepared. Um, uh, and I think we just probably haven't gone quite deep enough to satisfy most people, which I suspect. Um, let's talk about if statements. Um, an if statement is a um, the main or the most simple kind of decision tree that you can put into a program. So far, everything we've done has been linear in that um, each line has been executed one after another um, every single time we've run a program. Sometimes, however, you don't want, you might want um, certain sections of your code only to run if certain conditions are met. Um, I'd like to introduce a new condition here. 
and that's age. So I'm 26 years old and we're going to use an if statement to, um, uh, to suggest that people who are under 18 use a different tool to, um, to assess their body mass. Um, and, it, and so to do that, this is, the general, uh, this is the general structure of an if statement. So I have the word if and two rounded brackets. And then anything inside the rounded bracket, I can put anything, almost anything I like inside the rounded brackets. But whatever expression I put in here, if that statement is true, then the contents of this code block will be run. If this statement is false, then the contents of this code block will be skipped. They will not run. And this allows us to create programs that behave differently in different situations. So in this case, what I'd like to do is, let's go if age is less than 18 rather. In this case, if the age is less than 18, let's echo a statement that says, um, uh, BMI is not suitable for children. Please use a percentile growth chart instead. Okay, so um, at the moment, my age is 26. So when the expression age less than 18 gets evaluated, that'll be false, which means this code block will be skipped and therefore this will just run as normal. So if I run this, we should get the same output. See, we still get the same, same um, PMI. Um, but let's change my age now to 16 and run the code and see what happens. So I run the script now, you can see I get BMI is not suitable for children. Please use a percentile growth chart instead. <clears throat> but you can see that um, we actually still get the, the BMI calculation that came on the end. Because this is now true, this code block is running. After this code block runs, because they're still arranged in this way, this code block still runs as well. So it's still calculating the, the BMI. Um, one way we can solve this is using an else statement and an else statement gets paired up with an if statement and i'll show you what it looks like so it's a another code block that you put between these curly brackets and this else statement exists to um, run in the case that this code block does not run so let me explain that again we know that when we run an if statement if this expression evaluates to true this code block will run if this expression evaluates to false, then this code block will be skipped. And in the case that we have an else statement, this code block will run. So if I grab this, this bit, so I'm just gonna cut this and paste it inside the else block. We now have a situation where if this expression is true, this will run. If this expression is false, this, this block here will run. So bearing in mind at the moment that our age is 16, and so this will evaluate to true, that means only this block should run. Let's run the program now and see what happens. And we get told BMI is not suitable for children. Please use a percentile growth chart instead. Very cool. Let's clear it. I'll change my age back to 26. If I um, uh, run the script now, you can see that because our age is more than 18, we're calculating the, the BMI. <coughs> Um, as we planned. All right, so I know that was only a very contrived example. Um, I did have a, a little bit more prepared, but I actually don't think we're gonna have time to kind of get through um, all of this kind of as a, as a complete package. Um, so at this time, what I might do, yeah, I was just, so someone's just suggested, can we do a Q and A? Um, I think now would actually be a good time to switch to Q and A. I'd love to take questions from you. Um, I'll switch back to my slides. Um, here, yeah, so I'll just stop sharing for a second. I'll pull this up. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> All right, I welcome anyone to fire any questions into the chat, or if you maybe if the one of the hosts wants to try and organize it so we could do video questions, that'd be cool. But um, <clears throat> far away, guys. 
Thank you, Josh, for such a great and interesting session and getting so early to be with us. Um, so we have some questions in the chat for you. Uh, if you would like to answer now, or perhaps we can, you can answer through, through email. Um, what was that? Sorry, I answer now or answer through? Uh, would you like to take some questions now, or yeah, we can uh, answer them through, a, through an, an email? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take some now. I've probably got around 15 minutes I can spend. I can see, actually, there's been a lot of questions that I've ignored during the... Yeah, I, I can I, I try to sort of filter out some of the questions, and uh, we do have a few exciting ones, and I'll try to bring in some of them to light. So we have a question here um, about the aspect of considering that coding can be repetitive in nature. Do you foresee machines or AI taking over uh, the need to code in the near future? Yeah, great question. This is a very hot topic at the moment. Um, I suspect many people in this audience will have heard of GPT-3, which is a, um, uh, a tool that was released by OpenAI recently. It's what's in beta. Um, and it's a, basically a very, very clever um, AI, almost a general AI model that has 175 billion parameters that we use to train the model. So an absolutely massive amount of data. Um, and it's doing really amazing things like writing, um, uh, writing ex uh, medical school exams, like acing them and um, writing, just writing poetry and not sort of procedurally generated poetry, you know, beautiful, witty, smart, meaningful, powerful, politically motivated, like just really kind of like human poetry. It's really worth checking it out if you haven't. Um, and there are tools where you can, people have made tools on the back of GPT-3 where, you know, you type into a box, hey, GPT-3, can you make me a website that, or a button for my website that looks like a watermelon? And it will generate a button that looks like a watermelon. Like it can understand your language and, and, and write things. Um, and so, yes, I can see a day where, huge chunks of programming um, uh, is written by machines. Um, but like all kind of technologies, um, there's a, a long way to go from where you, I guess, have proof of concept towards implementation. Um, and to be honest with you, even if I could, and so there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the space in terms of what is it gonna look like in 10 years? To be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think anyone on the world really knows the answer to that. Um, but I don't really accept that um, the potential that we might one day get replaced by machines is a like a perfectly legitimate argument to just not start learning today. Like I just don't really think that is a reason to sit on your hands. Yes, there may be a day where the majority of the code is written by machines, um, but I think you know having an understanding of how these how machines or how software is written, um, potential for issues in patient safety and and um, privacy I, th I still think it will benefit you even if it's um even if we are replaced um, which i'm not saying that we will be um but I, I don't accept that that's a reason not to learn today i think um, and i welcome anyone else's comments on on, on the topic <clears throat> right and I, I absolutely agree with you as well um i came across a point recently which 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 was uh about the fact that perhaps doctors who code or doctors who understand machines might replace doctors who don't code. Um, however, having, having professions or doctors or any other field being completely replaced by machines might not actually be as, as worrisome as we think. As long as we keep learning, um, there's quite a lot of potential. Absolutely. And on the topic of doctors being replaced, you know, I think it's important to be an open mind, to keep open minded about what the future might look like. Um, you know, I, from, from, from talking to people in there and from work, having worked in the public hospital sector, um, once you understand that data is actually the food that fuels these machines um, and you start to understand that lots and lots of health and hospital data is actually tied up in silos and not easily mineable and, um, you know, there's privacy concerns, there's security concerns, like even arranging the data required to train some of these models takes a decade or more. So, you know, I, I am I aware that lots of part of a doctor's job will be automated, but I, I, I personally can't see doctors being replaced anytime soon. Maybe, maybe at some point in the future, but I, I personally can't see it. I, I try not to be, because I am an optimist, I try not to be closed-minded about these things, but just knowing what I know about the challenges of health data, I can't see it yet. Right. Um, I'm right. to be proved wrong. 
<clears throat> Absolutely. And I think your optimism and this presentation on its own has incited quite a few uh, questions along the lines of resources and uh, places to look up to for beginners in coding. And uh, we have a few questions if Python is the best language to start with. Um, so just an overview of how someone who's new to coding should really go through this journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, that's probably the number one question I get asked is like, what is the best programming language to learn? Um, and so the first thing to note is that unfortunately, there's no best or like perfectly optimal language to learn for everything. Um, and it's really a matter of picking one that is um, aligned with what you're trying to do. So I've, 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 you know, I've had people come to me and say, oh, I've been grinding away at something like R for like 18 months and I'm not getting anywhere. And I said, well, you know, that's what, you know, no, no, nothing's nothing against R. It's like a great, you know, it's a very powerful language for the stuff that um, it, it is for. Um, but there just isn't the availability of, of open source tools for, you know, um, the range of things that there are for other programming languages. So I simplify it like this. If you've got absolutely no idea what kind of, if you have no experience, which this whole talk is kind of geared towards, people with very little or no experience, if you have no experience and no idea what you want to do, start with a bit of web development. So that's HTML and CSS, and then a, a logical language to go along with it. So PHP is my favorite, but you could use Python as well. Um, and the reason for that is it's extremely versatile. So if you join a team that's working on a mobile app, you can make the website or the, then the front end that interacts with the app. If you're um, uh, you know, in research, um, you can actually create um, websites to present research and also um, conduct research and gather data. So you can you know, um, gather data from um, journals using PHP automatically and like pass it and do all sorts of stuff. You can, um, uh, uh, if, you were, if you want to get into like entrepreneurship, like site hustling, being able to handle websites, create websites. And um, you know, even if you do use a tool like you know, WordPress or, or Shopify or whatever to launch your business, having one of those pre-made tools and a little bit of programming skills has a massive amount of synergy. So um, uh, there's that. And then if you, know, if you want to get involved in machine learning, you can use things like, I, I didn't mention before, Teachable Machine, that kind of like um, create your own machine learning model, which everyone here should check out, by the way. It's a really fun time. You can create machine learning models to you know, identify your housemates and you know, play music when they enter the room, etc. cetera. Um, uh, anywhere that you can run JavaScript, you can run your machine learning model. So you, you literally go in, you go into teachable machine and you go file, you know, save as, and then it's on your desk, desktop as a JavaScript file. And then you can run that in any like JavaScript environment. So um, that's really, really cool. Um, so on, on the topic of Python, I think, um, you know, if, you, if data science and AI is your main interest, then I think Python would be a good place to start. Also really good for automation. Um, uh, and then if you want to get into mobile apps, which um, there's lots of opportunity there as well for, you know, med ed, um, hospital information, um, uh, all sorts of different stuff, patient communities, do communities for doctors, you know, it's your, the only real limit is your, is your imagination. Um, I think in that case, in the case that you want to do mobile apps, um, I recommend Flutter, as I mentioned during the talk. Um, I think called React is another option, but... I don't, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in, in frameworks and languages and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of like an advanced topic about what's the best framework for this situation or whatever. Um, what I, I don't really, what I don't want you to leave this talk with the idea is that there's a, there, there's, there's no perfect language. And I find that lots of beginners and allow them to become paralyzed or like analysis paralysis. You get so obsessed with like, kind of like what is the absolute best one? Um, I would recommend just diving in and starting um, and lots of the, the patterns that we discussed today. And so variables, if statements, and there's lots more, you know, there's a four loops and there's, you know, conditional, there's all sorts of stuff. Lots of those will actually translate between programming languages. So just get started and, and you'll find that you'll, um, uh, you'll pick up skills that actually will be transferable. Yeah. Right, right. And, and through this, through this journey, have you sort of, uh, do you have a rough timeline of how long it took you to actually uh, get a hang of at least the basics of coding? Yeah, and I, I guess an associated question that I just see as someone has put in the chat, and another one that I get a lot, um, is how long does it take to learn? 
Um, unfortunately, I can't answer, answer that question in objective terms. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, it's analogous to how long is a piece of string. Um, um, so what, what, I'd, what I'd comment, well, the main thing I'd say here is that there's a, obviously a real spectrum in kind of skills that you can have with programming, you know, and right up at the advanced end, there's, you know, bleeding edge technology stuff like, you know, clinical research on machine learning models and computer vision models and, and really, really advanced applications of statistics that they use for that kind of stuff. Then maybe a little bit below there, there's still, still really advanced. There's, you know, um, complex hospital IT systems that confidentially store patient data and, and transport that data and make it accessible to clinicians. That's still really, really advanced. That, you know, is mostly the domain of, of professionals, that kind of stuff. Having said that, you can still, you know, with enough effort, get to that level if you want to. The point I'd like to make is you actually don't need to get up here to be very, very useful with your programming skills. You can get to an intermediate level and have your own kind of side project. So your own, your own, you know, calculator, you know, like gentamicin dosing calculator or, um, you know, or that blood transfusion app, like apps that are useful, but they don't store patient information. They don't, you know, um, affect like um, uh, uh, clinical outcomes comes in an algorithmic way in the way that a machine learning model would those product um, projects are well within a beginner's reach within a first, within a couple of months so you know i guess i'd say hello world obviously takes 10 minutes you know um you know simple like a, a website for yourself that's got a blog and you know some information might take a, sm a small number of weeks you know um apps that don't store patient data and just kind of like store other, other knowledge might take, you know, you know, a couple of months perhaps. And then there's, I guess, this whole spectrum of increasing complexity that could go up to take many, many years. And, you know, mm -hmm. you can talk to, you know, PhDs in computer science who say they don't, you know, know programming because, you know, it, there's so many layers to it. So the, the answer to that question is it's a spectrum. Um, but I, the, the take home message is you don't have to be an apps. You don't have to be a PhD to be really useful. Um, because of, because especially if you're a clinician, you have other insight to bring to the table when we're talking about software projects. Right. Right. And that makes perfect sense as well. Um, I'm, I'm in just in sort of the respect for time at the moment, I'll take in one more question. Um, so this, this one's, this one's interesting in the sense that once you have your process of building or coding and you have something to present, uh, how do you go about approaching your hospital or asking for them to implement uh, your application? Really, that's a fantastic question, Faisal. It's, it's not an easy process. Um, the, for good reasons, um, hospitals are cons generally conservative with this kind of thing. They're, you know, Patient safety is typically at the absolute forefront of um, their minds and, and as such, they... They do want a fairly kind of rigorous um, quality assurance process to be in place. Um, the number one thing that has helped me get deployed in hospitals is actually having a relatively senior clinician, um, essentially on the inside, who is an advocate for you and the project that you're doing. Um, and that's not always easy to get, um, but the, the, the best way to get that is to actually start with one of those clinicians and say, what are the problems that you're having? Let me try and solve it for you. If you can solve a genuine problem for one of those clinicians, you've probably got them as an advocate. They're probably going to get back you if you can genuinely solve their problem. Right. Once you have a senior clinician, um, the more senior, the better, or not necessarily a clinician, just someone very senior in the hospital who is advocating for you, um, getting through all of that bureaucracy and that QA, the quality assurance, tends to be a lot easier. Um, so unfortunately it comes down to things like networking. So having a good relationship with that um, clinician or the, the, the committees that are approving your application or whatever you've built um, and patience. So I mentioned that blood transfusion app that I've deployed at the hospitals that started as an A3 sheet of paper that was up on the wall and the process of getting it from an A3 sheet of paper that would sometimes get lost and, you know, not be available in an emergency and that, people would be sending staff across the hospital to get the A3 sheet so that they could decide what one products to give. So I took that sheet, I put it onto a phone app, made it accessible to every single clinician at their, in their pocket within a second. And getting the, the level of approval that we needed still took between 12 and 18 months. It was about 12 months to get into the first hospital. And then it was, yeah, almost 18 months before we'd gotten into wow. the second. 
Um, and so, you know, I, and to, yeah, you know, I wasn't working on that full time. It's not like I was, you know, hustle, hassling them every day about getting it approved, but I guess, you know, for something that simple, that was still how long it took. And that was only, a, as I said, like kind of like a side project, but um, the programming for that for me took about probably, probably two days. Obviously I had, I had a lot of experience programming at the time, but the implementation and the quality insurance took a year. So yeah. that's one of the challenges in health technology. And I, I, during my talk, I was talking about having clinicians who are techie and open to change. And so I actually believe that society will benefit from having te- um, doctors who are more techie and, you know, hopefully we can cut down some of that time to get innovation happening while maintaining patient safety. Absolutely. And I, I love the way you phrased it because I think uh, this speaks for a lot of us across different fields, including healthcare as well. So um, I'm, I'm looking at the comments as well, and it's been a very positive response from everyone. I'm, I'm sorry that we could not answer all the questions, but uh, Dr. Josh is just as available uh, on Twitter, on uh, his email, and he shared it on the screen as well. So feel free to get in touch with him. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Josh, for coming over as part of the Clinician Engineer Hub. Uh, really appreciate your time and efforts. It's my absolute pleasure, Faisal. Um, thank you very much for having me. And I, I look forward to being back and maybe building on this in the future. That's wonderful. And for our viewers, uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Clinician Engineer Hub. We're also available on Twitter and um, we'll be happy to continue the series based on your positive responses. Thank you again, everyone. Take care.